Turks, thank you, Grant, and with you guys. Uh, we've got a pending disaster here, uh, as Anna has begun to tell you about yesterday, as we've been telling you about for months now. Uh, there's been the negotiations going on, and uh, and right now, I think my assessment of the what appears to be near the end result, but you're about to influence that in a second, is total disaster. Uh, so, uh, but we're gonna break it down for you guys. We're gonna give you the details. And again, uh, check all your sources. Other people disagree. They think this might be a great, complete capitulation. Okay, anyways, right. all right. Uh, without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, well, so Joe Biden has released the framework for the budget reconciliation bill. The bill that originally was supposed to be around five or six trillion dollars was whittled down to 3.5 trillion dollars and now will be in the ballpark of 1.75 trillion dollars, which means a lot of provisions got cut. Some things remained, but they don't have the same type of funding that was originally proposed. I wanna give you a quick summary of what's in and what's out of the budget reconciliation bill. And then we'll have a discussion about whether or not it should be supported by progressives, especially justice Democrats. Now the framework includes universal preschool for more than 6 million three and four year olds and subsidies for childcare that would limit childcare costs to no more than 7% of income, meaning that it will in fact be means tested for families earning up to $300,000 a year. Now the $400 billion in funding for both those provisions would last for six years. Then these programs would expire. Democrats are under the impression that the programs would be so popular that even if Republicans were in charge, they would have no choice but to extend these programs. We'll see. Now, $555 billion will be allocated for programs to move Americans to electric vehicles and also entice utilities away from natural gas and coal. Now here's where I'm gonna stop and just note that while Biden and the rest of the corporate Democrats were ready and willing to give Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema all of their cookies, all of the important provisions in this bill, there is still no commitment from Manchin or Sinema that they will in fact vote in favor of the budget reconciliation bill. And I, I say that now because the last graphic I read to you regarding the coal and and you know the, the gas, natural gas, Remember, Manchin is against any provision that would hurt his bottom line. He is invested in the coal industry and he makes a lot of money off of it, which is why it's been a red line for him. So I just find it fascinating that they're still playing these games about how they're going to do something about climate change. I don't think that provision is gonna make it at the end of the day, but for now it's still in the bill. One of the major climate provisions was in fact taken out. That was the one that would penalize fossil fuel companies and reward them if they do in fact decide to move toward renewable energy. Yeah, and so that one didn't make it at all because that, that actually would have been very effective in getting them to move off of coal. And as you're gonna see later in the program, uh, TYT investigates has another story about how Manchin's fortunes have greatly increased throughout the negotiations because uh, the markets realize, oh no, coal's here to stay, Manchin's gonna protect it, and he's got millions of dollars in coal. All right, now, uh, look, I, I think the uh, there's two issues here. Number one is, uh, Leadership is trying to still get progressives to vote for the bipartisan infrastructure bill first. Oh, they're like, oh, new emergency. Joe Biden's gonna take a trip. And if he's getting on a plane, we have to have it voted on. Do you? I don't care at all. Good news on that front, progressives aren't buying that. But the bigger issue is, well, what's in the actual Build Back Better bill, a worse name for a bill ever. Anyway, BBB. Uh, yeah, that's actually slightly better. <laughs> anyway, um, and there, as Anna's explaining to you, and we got more on it, we got almost none of the progressive priorities left. It yes. totally eviscerated. So we're gonna ask you guys to help with 
pushing for at least one, one of our priorities. Otherwise, the ship's gonna sail. So, and they're still working on this. So this one is possible. It's definitely possible, but you gotta put pressure on now. If you don't put pressure on now, the ship's gonna sail without it. So it's paid family and medical leave act. In fact, the medical part is likely to be dropped, but at a minimum, for God's sake, just do paid family leave. And so it used to be 12 weeks, they knocked it down to four weeks. And as we told you a couple of days ago, then they knocked it down to zero, nothing at all. You get pregnant right back into the mines the minute you deliver the baby, okay? So we got a petition up right now at tyt.com slash petition slash no deal. But you can just go to slash petitions, you can hit the link in the description box, but it or infrastructure vote. So. Uh, make sure that you're participating, we get to 10,000. At least then it gets the press's attention, it gets progressive legislators attention. Oh, There's a lot of people who really, really want paid family leave. Now the reality is of course, the overwhelming majority of the country wants it. But we have to do things like petitions to get their attention. Because otherwise they're like, oh, I don't know, corporations say no. So it's kind of 90-10 against it. No, no, it's not, we all want it. And if you don't even have that, then they should vote no, no deal, hashtag no deal. Otherwise, we got hearing, hearing in Medicare, yeah. as Anna's about to explain to you, and that's about it. Right, and and we'll give you some of the statements from progressives in regard to everything that's going on a little later in the show. But just to get back to what's in and what's out, yes, as it stands today, paid family and medical leave is not in the bill, but there is still a possibility that it'll be added back, okay? Progressives are claiming that they're fighting for that. We'll see what happens. Um, expansion of Medicare to cover vision, dental, and hearing was down to just hearing. Attacks on the wealth of billionaires was also out, as I uh, covered yesterday. In of favor of, in favor of a surtax on multimillionaires that would hit income, but not their mountains of wealth, meaning that there is no wealth tax included in the Build Back Better plan. Now, the promise of two free years of community college also gone, unfulfilled, and the expanded child tax credit passed in March to give most families a $300 per child income support would be extended only till 2023, okay? So it will not be permanent, it will be extended for an additional year. Now, um, instead of the two years, this is the part that gets me. Instead of the two years of free community college, Democrats put in a bold, bold provision of increasing Pell Grants to the tune of $550. Ooh. That's it, $550, wow. that Until, is it. And I didn't know they were gonna be this tough in negotiations. And what's frustrating is that despite all of the things that have been cut out, you already see the cheerleading from Democratic leadership, which we'll get to in just a second. But the outline also omitted a proposal, long a Democratic priority to lower the cost of prescription drugs by allowing Medicare to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies. And among the provisions that did happen to survive, our federal programs for home health care and community care for older Americans and people with disabilities. The framework also contains $150 billion for rental assistance, home buying help, public housing repair and other affordable programs. Now, before I get to the so called pay force for what remains in this stripped down bill, I just want to give you a little taste of what House Speaker Nancy Pelosi had to say in regard to the bill. And you know, the cheerleading has begun, the positive PR has begun, the complete revisionist, you know, take on this bill has begun, and it's incredibly frustrating. Let's watch. Today we will be having a hearing. They'll hear from our chairman about the greatness of the Build Back Better initiative and it's pretty exciting. I'm so proud of the work that our chairs have done and the work that everybody did to try to cut it in half and in a way that we could maintain support for it because that is competition for the dollar even at 3.5 trillion. When you cut it in half, it becomes, shall we say, keener. She's so proud, a bill that was originally proposed as a five to six trillion dollar bill, now down to 1.75 trillion and has cut out major, major provisions that would have 
really improved people's lives. So uh, I think she accidentally uh, said the truth there. She says she's really proud that she cut it in half. Well, she is. That's uh, we look. What did we tell you? You saw it with your own eyes. We told you, and no one else in media told you this. That Biden and Pelosi and Schumer never meant any of those provisions. They never meant to pass the progressive priorities. It was always a trick. Why is she proud today that she cut it in half? Because her corporate donors are going to be thrilled, absolutely thrilled that she did exactly what she had promised them. And Biden did exactly what he promised. Nothing would fundamentally change. All of this stuff is around the edges, it's adding money to programs that already exist or or little add-ons. I mean, look, the Medicare provision is a perfect example. Bernie wanted dental, vision, and hearing in med added to Medicare. That would have made a big difference in a lot of people's lives. And you know what they did? They compromised on just hearing. So no, no teeth for you. And we don't, and you can go blind if you like. But at least you'll be able to hear. Okay. Yeah, and, and let me add to that. Just to really express how awful Joe Manchin is, because. In these negotiations, President Biden was like, okay, fine, uh, why don't we go ahead, we'll, we'll take out the, uh, uh, the, the vision, we'll take out the dental coverage uh, in this Medicare expansion. But how about we at least add an $800 voucher for dental? And Manchin's like, no, can't even do the $800 voucher. For Medicare recipients. Because all corporate executives already have dental insurance, they don't need that at all. So why would he agree to it? You know why they included hearing? It's a fake compromise. Hearing costs almost nothing. Dental costs a lot, vision costs a decent amount. Hearing is barely an issue. So I, one of our members had a hilarious comment that they just wrote in with Occam's Taser wrote in, are they leaving hearing coverage in so we can hear the screams of everyone we left behind? Or, oh, or the laughs of the corporate Dems, maybe. Maybe, and so by the way, one of the reasons they kept hearing it, other than the fact that it's nearly irrelevant, is that apparently cinema has some sort of issue with hearing. So, <laughs> well, she certainly can't hear her voters, that's for sure. De right? Definitely does not listen. So, yeah. so cinema was like, I will allow hearing. <laughs> Okay, so this is where we are. Look, everybody else is gonna pretty it up for you. Honestly, even some progressives might pretend to pretty it up for you. This it's uh, unprecedented bill. Uh, this is historic change, it's amazing. And look, we're fair and honest. There are there are some provisions in here that aren't so bad. Yes, we've told you about universal pre-K before, and we told you corporations love that because it's gonna drive you back to work and subsidized by the taxpayers, but it's still a good thing. But also on top of that, there's a 15% minimum tax on the profits of large corporations and including including their uh, the money they make abroad. That's actually really good, okay? Now, mind you, it's just 15%, okay? We didn't raise taxes on any corporations at all. Trump's tax cuts remain, they remain basically permanent. This is the Democrats surrendering to Trump's tax cuts. Yes. So that's both those things are true. You shouldn't leave out the minimum tax, that's a good thing. But you also shouldn't kid yourself that there's not a single dollar of tax increases above what, where Trump left the, the actual rates. And again, I, I really want to reiterate that given how pared back this reconciliation bill is today, even with everything taken out, still no commitment from Joe Manchin or Kirsten Cinema. There are some aides, some anonymous sources who have told the press that cinema is now supportive of the reconciliation bill. I'd like to hear it out of her own mouth. The fact that she's unwilling to publicly support the bill as it stands today is telling, it really is. So with that said, why don't we move over to progressives, unless you have one other thing to add. Yeah, I just wanted yeah. to say one last thing. Guys, to give you a sense of what a debacle this is, um, look, they took out the lowering drug prices. That has an 88% approval. Do we really live in a democracy? Why'd they take it out? Because of drug companies. Is this really a democracy? No, and they, they the only thing that matters is what the approval rating is among corporate donors. If they don't like it, we ain't getting it. So I saw or I listened to a podcast, a New York Times podcast that had featured Anna and small parts of it, The Daily. And it's amazing, mainstream media journalists, they just, I think they literally don't know anything about politics. They're, they're like, why is cinema doing this? We can't, like, is it, does she think that Arizona's more Republican than it appears to be? It's the, the 
no, look, guys. All right, so they drug. If, why do you go against an 88% approval rating, right? Obviously, because of the drug companies. Fossil fuel companies didn't want the climate provisions that were the most impactful, so they were taken out for the fossil fuel companies. The billionaire tax was taken out for who, guys? No, if you're a right winger, you're independent, you're anybody. If you're a mainstream media reporter, I know you'll be like, oh, it had to be helped to help the poor and the middle class, right? No, it was taken out because everybody knows it to help billionaires. Because it's a billionaire tax, period. So don't let, I mean, there's one thing that, got, uh, that remains. It's a gas of a sort, it's gaslighting. Don't let the mainstream media and the corporate Democrats gaslight you. They took out the billionaire's tax to help billionaires. Every person that's a real person knows that. So by God, at least when we get, when we're having a baby, can we not be driven back into the mines the very next day? So tyt.com slash petitions, if they don't get that, they'll pass it anyway, right? They, you know how politics is, it's hopeless, right? But we say they should say no deal. And you should be very adamant about it, including the progressive legislators, because this is, this. Compromise is awful. Remember, 1.5 trillion is what Manchin said he wanted. We wanted three and a half trillion, and we ended up at 1.75. Where's the compromise? No, we got slaughtered here. You got to, at a minimum, give us paid family leave. All right, why don't we take a brief break? When we come back, we'll tell you how progressives have responded to all of this, what is likely to happen. You don't want to miss that story. And then later, uh, as if everything that cinema is engaged in wasn't insulting enough to her constituents and to Democratic voters. Uh, she's really rubbing things in our faces today uh, by referencing Ted Lasso of all things. So we've got that story and more. Stick around, we'll be right back. All right, back on TYT, Jenk and Anna with you guys. In case uh, any legislators are watching, uh, the jury is in. Every uh, one watching hates this so-called compromise. Jazz Maven in the member section wrote in, this is pathetic. Corporate donors win and we lose. That is no compromise. Uh, and Canada Dan said, admittedly, I do not live in paradise here in Canada. But man, I feel I'm so much better off than you guys down there. It's beyond belief what's going on, the corruption and nothing going anywhere. Yep. That's America for you, Anna. All right, let's talk about progressives. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is pressuring progressives to vote in favor of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. There were some reports indicating that she would have held a vote today. Now the bipartisan infrastructure bill is the corporate handout bill. There wasn't a mention about the budget reconciliation bill. Even with it stripped down, there's Still no bill ready to vote on. And so the question is, are progressives gonna fall for this? Are we done negotiating on the reconciliation bill? Are they even willing to vote in favor of the corporate handout bill? Now, before I get to the details of how this is all going down, I wanna go to this video featuring Nancy Pelosi in her press conference today, where she was talking about how transformative the stripped down budget reconciliation bill is. Let's watch. I said, how is this transformational if you're having to cut things like paid leave, these major climate programs, and what are the plans going forward to try to deal with some of those? Well, thank you so much for your question. It is transformative and it is historic and it's uh, uh, the issues that it addresses and it's not issues, these are values. I'm still fighting for paid leave. I frankly have a hard time debating it because I don't understand why we don't wouldn't have that. But nonetheless, it does not undermine the fact uh, that we have nearly a trillion dollars in universal pre-K, child care, child tax credit, home health care, and the rest. So one program, as important as it is, does not subtract from the rest of it. Again, we still want that. How can I say that this is not, how can I say that this is transformative? Because it is. Because it is. Because children in 12 states, families in 12 states will now have access to the Affordable Care Act because we'll have a half a trillion dollars to save the planet. This is 
quite remarkable. And if you took any one piece of it, it would be transformative and historic. Taking together, it's quite a spectacular vision that President Biden has put forth. So it's a, it's a big values issue for us. Anytime you want to ask me why I think this is transformative, I'm happy to answer that question. I would disagree with this being a transformative bill. Now, just to give you a sense of how it's not transformative. I mean, it started off with a permanent child tax credit. It was supposed to be a permanent child tax credit, which would have cut child poverty in half. So as it's begun, like the, the very first initial proposal, I would argue doesn't go far enough. Why don't we get rid of child poverty in the richest country in the world, right? They got rid of that. Meaning that it will not be permanent, it'll only be extended for an additional year. How is this a transformative bill? Universal pre-K, great, that, that's, a, that's a great provision. I would argue that that's not gonna transform the country. But anyway, look, this is all part of a pressure campaign to get progressives to sign on to the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which is clearly their top priority, that's what they care about the most. And there's still no bill to vote for in terms of the budget reconciliation bill. They're still going back and forth regarding the framework of that bill. And one other thing I wanna note is that the corporate media is playing along with Democrats, Democratic leadership. Here is an excerpt from a CNN report that states, one thing is for sure, if progressives don't eventually come aboard, even if they're dissatisfied with the compromises made to get the package through the Senate, they could inflict huge damage on Biden's already wobbling presidency. So in other words, Biden's cowardice, weakness and failure to play hardball with corporate Dems is somehow the progressives fault. No, that's on him. So blaming progressives for his failures is pretty pathetic. It goes a little further than that. If you just stretch out the logic a little bit, progressives are actually fighting for the original Biden plan. It was Biden's plan that he put forward. So now corporate media has flipped it on its head and saying, since progressives are fighting for Biden's plan, they're hurting Biden. But wait a minute, they eviscerated Biden's plan, the corporate Democrats did, Manchin and Cinema did, and they cut it in half and then Pelosi came out and bragged about how it's cut in half. So how are progressives fighting against Biden's agenda? No, look, but it's but we told you this a long time ago. You, you saw it with your own eyes. We told you the corporate media at the end would be the thugs that would come in and intimidate progressives. And they would yell at them in unison. You heard us say it, and here it is. It's happening just like we told you it would happen. And they're coming and go, oh, it's all the progressives' fault. Of course it's the progressives. Just take crumbs as you always do and learn to deal with it. No media figure apparently figured out. I mean, we're gonna get to this in a minute, but Don Lemon was talking to Jamal Bowman and he's like confounded as to why there isn't a deal yet. It's corporate donors, knucklehead, it's corporate donors. And so look, I'm done being frustrated with mainstream media. I don't think they're bright enough to even understand the one thing about politics, but the rest of us totally get it, it's obvious. So when you see Pelosi out there, it's, it's hashtag marketing. Oh, it's all it is is marketing. Oh, it's transformative, why? Because I say it is, now write it down. So today she went into a Congressional Progressive Caucus meeting in order to pressure progressives to vote in favor of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. She wanted to bring that to the House floor for a vote today. And apparently she was being so annoying about it that they kicked her out of the meeting. Now, Pelosi's spokesperson completely denies that that happened. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't believe him. But I do also wanna give you some statements from President Joe Biden because he's also, of course, engaging in this pressure campaign. He says, we have a framework that will get 50 votes in the United States Senate. Let's just pause for a second. Manchin and Cinema still have not committed to voting for the budget reconciliation bill. Let me continue. Don't think it's hyperbole to say that the House and Senate majorities and my presidency will be determined by what happens in the next week. Told you, we told you that at the end, Biden would come out and beat up progressives. So now he's, he never laid a glove on Manchin and Cinema. Now, yes, sir, absolutely, sir, we'll take it out, sir. By the way, why? They had the same donors. 
They're the same donors, it was theater, it was always theater, okay? So yeah. now that he's turning around and going, my entire presidency depends on this progressives. And it, you no. better do it within the next week, otherwise there'll be hell to pay. Oh, really? How about, how about a little personal responsibility? Because let me tell you something, as much as I despise Donald Trump and, and the terrible person he is, let's just imagine in a topsy-turvy world, Donald Trump was the one who's trying to pass the build back better agenda, okay? You know what Donald Trump would do? He would immediately call for an investigation into Joe Manchin's daughter who broke antitrust laws by conspiring with Pfizer to ensure that Pfizer didn't release a generic version of the EpiPen so her pharmaceutical company could jack up the prices to whatever she wanted. She broke laws, there should be a DOJ investigation. Or how I, about I would, I would hate for you and your daughter to have to deal with this DOJ investigation mansion. How about firing his wife who got a cushy little federal job that she wanted? How about that? But Biden's not Biden doesn't want it. He just doesn't want it. Let's just be real about it, okay? When you really want something and you're in a position of power, you're the president of the United States, you will do what's necessary to get it done. Biden's not doing it because he doesn't want it. In fact, guess what he did? Pulled his buddy in, same person who helped save him in the primary election, President Barack Obama. Former President Barack Obama chimed in with a public statement calling for the outline, calling the outline, meaning the reconciliation bill, a giant leap forward. Of course, the yeah. Obama marketing has begun. Okay, whenever they have a corporate deal, corporate Obama comes in to sanction it and says, now everybody bow your heads. Uh, the king corporate man has arrived and he has the best marketing in all of America. Corporate media has kissed his ass for so long, he's golden. Everybody bow down to the corporate deal that Obama and Biden have sanctioned. So look guys, um, for everybody else is gonna lie to you and they're gonna pretend that Biden always wanted it, but golly gee, he just couldn't get all the provisions. He couldn't get any of the provisions that he claimed to be in favor of. Hey, all the ones that were cut were all progressive provisions. Golly gee, what? that's a tough break. But you know, if it is a tough break, then aren't you incompetent? Media, like make it make up your mind. I know you just, you're not actual journalists, you're the really low level marketing guys in this corporate ladder, it's really pathetic. But make up your mind, is Joe Biden amazing because he got his agenda through? Or is he incompetent because he couldn't get any of the things he said he was gonna get through through? Yeah. So it, none of it makes any sense. And one of the things they said to progressives, they're like, you know, if you guys are good boys and girls, Joe Biden will come speak to you. Ooh, yeah. well, who cares? I mean, it, look at how, look at the mindset of Washington. Like, who cares about policy? But Biden will come talk to you and then you can go brag at home that you're buddies with Biden mm -hmm. and that'll give you a little extra marketing. Pathetic. So, actually, progressives kind of kicking out Pelosi from that meeting is actually the bravest and, and, Best thing I've seen them ever do. Great, more of that, we yeah. need more of that. Yeah. So look, the real question is, what are progressives planning on doing, right? There, there's some mixed messaging and I think we need to get into that. So let's talk about it. Now that uh, corporate Democrats and Democratic leadership are applying pressure to progressives to sign on to the bipartisan infrastructure deal. What are progressives like Senator Bernie Sanders saying? Are they in favor of the paired down budget reconciliation bill? Are they willing to vote in favor of the bipartisan infrastructure deal, which is nothing more than a corporate handout bill? Well, here's what Bernie Sanders had to say. What I would say is you have the outline of a very significant piece of legislation. He's referring to the reconciliation bill, but he argues, I want us to make it better. That's what Bernie said. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not a significant piece of legislation. It, it's not. I, I'm guessing he says that to be diplomatic. No, and I he hate says it. it because they're <laughs> gonna he's gonna agree to pass it. Let's be honest. So I want him to fight harder on paid family leave and dental and vision, but a lot of this stuff is paid family leave has not the ship has not sailed. By the way, they claim that uh, they're still fighting on uh, lowering drug prices. I but uh, number one, I would be shocked. Number two, right now we have a petition saying just for God's sake, get paid family leave. Already about 3,000 people have signed it within like a couple of hours and a half an hour or so or less. But look, if they, but a lot of the people signing it are leaving notes saying, I don't know that I even like it with paid family leave. 
<laughs> we're only getting like one and a half things out of the 10 that we wanted. Um, if they got lower drug prices, our ability to negotiate, then it would actually be a good bill. And I would say, hey, despite all of our losses, mm -hmm. yes, God bless, that's a big, big difference maker. But I would be shocked if they got that. All right, so we've got a lot of video to get to. And I wanna start with Jamal Bowman speaking to Don Lemon on CNN. He was asked specifically whether he would support the reconciliation bill as it stands today. I did not really appreciate his answer on that, but he did have some statements in response to Manchin, so let's watch. What do you think, if that's out, are you in? You know, that remains to be determined. Uh, we're the only developed country in the world that does not have paid family leave. So uh, it remains to be determined where I am uh, now that I'm hearing that that is out. Will you vote for the spending bill if, the, if that's not in it? Again, it, rem we, it remains to be seen, right? This negotiation uh, has been changing seemingly minute by minute. So maybe I'm being unfair, I, I, I would have preferred a strong statement, a, a strong no, I'm not gonna vote for it as it stands today. Uh, but maybe he's just trying to make a point about how things are constantly changing and you don't know what the final bill is gonna be, I don't know. But uh, I, I think it's important for progressives to stand their ground and make it abundantly clear that the bill as it stands today without paid family leave is a no-go for them. They're gonna vote no, that's not what we got in that interview. So we have a petition on that, TY. T.com slash petitions. Okay, so uh, look, um, he can't go out on his own and say, no, I'm drawing a line on it. Um, Why? Um, because they they work together and they uh, and if one person goes out and does it, uh, the others feel like, well, you didn't check with us and that wasn't cool, right? Now, that doesn't mean that uh, they shouldn't have already had a position on this. That's the problem, right? You know, so if you had effective leadership, if you had effective leadership, you would have already known where your red lines are. You would have known it months ago. And you would have all had a meeting and you would have decided if there's no paid family leave and there's no lowering drug prices, we're gonna vote no, no matter what else is in the bill. And then you would have insisted on that publicly at every turn like Manchin and Cinema did. Manchin and Cinema said, if you ever raise $1 of taxes of our beloved rich, we vote no, it's a red line. Right, so they had red lines and we didn't. So that's a failure of leadership. Jamal, I thought that a, a Congressman Bowman did a good job, and and you know he's been on the show, and you could say I'm biased, etc. But I thought he did a, a, a much better job than almost any other Democrat, because he said I might not vote for it, whereas almost no other Democrat is willing to say that. Well, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib said, "Hell no." No, that's different, and I love that she said that. But she said hell no to voting for the bipartisan uh, bill. Before bipartisan the bill before voting for the uh, reconciliation bill. Okay, right? fair enough. Um, so I wanted to go to one more clip uh, featuring Bowman because I actually think the question that Don Lemon asks here is a good question. So let's take a look at that, and we'll discuss. Are you concerned that it looks like your party is blowing it and that Democrats can't govern? And you know that has huge ramifications. Well, governing is about negotiation, right? And negotiating. I understand and negotiating that. That's true. Takes no, 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 no. I get that. I get that. It That's takes not what time, I'm saying. man. I'm not talking about negotiating, <laughs> but governing is also gaining control of the narrative. In my district, Don, if I may interject briefly, in my district, people are excited that someone is finally fighting for them. But Home your district is workers. not the country. Your That's district true, is not the country. I understand that. You have to look out for your district. Hold on, when hold you on, look hold at on. polling across the country, when you look at polling, across the American the country, people are aligned with the Build Back Better Act. Okay, but when you look at polling across the country, the American people don't know what Democrats are doing. They see that there's infighting among Democrats. The president's poll numbers are sinking. So I can agree that we need to do a better job of communicating, of engaging with the districts that will benefit the most from the Build Back Better Act. I saw that line of questioning by Don Lemon as an opportunity. Now, obviously, Don Lemon is like trying to place the blame on the progressives for the infighting, which is stupid, but it's still an opportunity. It's an opportunity for Bowman to say, yeah, Biden's uh, approval ratings not so great. Maybe it's because he campaigned on promising 
the reversal of Trump era tax cuts. He campaigned on improving people's lives. He campaigned on the provisions that are now stripped out of the budget reconciliation bill because he refuses to hold corrupt corporate Democrats in the Senate accountable. He refuses to play hardball, but he didn't do that. So like, yeah, I know, I'm being, do I know that. none of them are gonna do that. So like, it, look, it, I'm being a little too harsh, I guess, but the point of Justice Democrats is to fight. Yeah. Is to fight. Yeah. Okay, the, the platitudes and the diplomacy when there has been no diplomacy directed at them by Biden or the corporate Democrats is disgusting. Yeah, so look, uh, let's now give you both sides of it because both sides are correct, but one side is more correct than the other. So let me explain. Um, so Bowman did a great job of going after Manchin and going after the interests that are funding him, okay? And he was alone in doing that on television. He went on CNN and he was willing to fight back. So give him credit on that. Don Lemon asked a normal, fair question. You guys are you know, not getting to a conclusion and it would obviously be disastrous if you don't. He's got a progressive on there, so he's gonna ask the progressive. So that that's my, like that's one side to be fair to both of them, right? Now, on the other side is, well, but Don, You say, okay, you guys have been negotiating too long. Well, how do you resolve that? I would say, so Don, what do you want me to do? Just surrender? Okay, it's taking too long, so why? I agree. Then that's why Bowman went on to say it's Manchin's fault. Because it is Manchin's fault. Manchin and Cinema are blocking the agenda. And so, what are you telling me it's taking too long for? Why don't they get on board? So, if you say to me, if I'm in the middle of negotiation, somebody's saying it's taking too long, so you should surrender. No. No, then you don't understand what negotiation is. And then the second giant kind of, not just misnomer, but misdirection that Don Lemon is doing, I think accidentally, which doesn't speak well of him either, to be honest, is that he says, well, the American people don't know what's in the bill. Well, Don, you're on air, why don't you tell them, okay? And so he says, you know, like people are confused by it. No, they're not. When you ask them policy by policy, it is overwhelmingly popular. Don, how about this? Uh, negotiating drug prices has an 88% popularity. Nine out of 10 Americans are in favor of it. What's confusing about that? There's nothing confusing about that. Don, do you wanna know why it's not in the bill? Because corporate donors killed it. Because drug companies paid off, bribed, legally bribed Manchin and Cinema, and by the way, also Biden and Pelosi. Now, if you're saying, hey, but Cenk, Anna's right. Why don't Justice Democrats just say that? Well, first of all, we say it, Nina Turner says it on CNN, etc. But in Washington, there's a culture of never ever criticize fellow Democrats, let alone Democratic leadership. It is considered heresy of the highest order. Do I think they should break that rule? Of course, of course they should break that rule. You're getting killed in these negotiations. Now having said that, to be fair, have Justice Democrats like Rashida Tlaib, AOC, Jamal Bowman and Cori Bush gone farther than any other member of Congress in my lifetime in criticizing fellow Democrats, yes. So now, however you wanna take that, you take it. But to me, the number one problem there, at least Bowman went on air to fight back, which I didn't see from anyone else, okay? But the number one problem is corporate media who's like, why don't you just surrender already to Mansion and Cinema? I'm so confused by what's in the bill. And of course, I'm not gonna explain it to my audience. So I don't know, I'm just gonna blame Democrats for not getting it done. By the way, how about Republicans? Every single Republican is against it. So why don't you ever talk about what monsters they are and how they're against nine out of 10 Americans, including all of their voters? Yep, um, all right, look, we'll see how progressives play play this. Um, it's just not looking good. Uh, and right now we're going in this like back in, we're back in that argument about whether they can vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill before the reconciliation bill. Like I don't care about that. Like the reconciliation bill as it stands today is not good. So we'll see what happens. We'll fill you guys in as we learn more, but that's where we're at right now. Yeah, I just wanna say one more thing. Look, the reason we're doing the petition is so that at least the progressive legislators realize, because they're in a Washington bubble. And everyone in the bubble is saying you guys are radicals for even wanting 10% of this bill. Who okay. cares what Washington no, says? No, because they're influenced by it, they don't realize it. No, I know it. they are. No, but they but don't realize it. The, you, the reason you do the petition is so you go, hey, over here guys, the rest of the country hates that you're giving in, hates it. And we're saying for God's sake, if you don't get paid family leave, you should vote no. 
Vote no, vote no. To them, they've literally never heard it, it's heresy to them. So Bowman is like going out of on a limb to say that he might not vote for it. Because you guys, it's hard for them to understand the rest of the country. But it's also hard for us to understand the, the existence they're in. It's like they put like these headphones on them in Washington. And all they ever hear is surrender, surrender, surrender. And if you don't, you're a very mean, offensive person who's gonna destroy the Democratic Party. So that is the context. That's why you need to get involved, tyt.com slash petitions. You see it right there, and we'll put the link down below. And let them know, no, you don't want this deal. If it doesn't even have paid family leave, and it doesn't have any of these provisions, you don't want the deal. I guarantee you, they'll be actually genuinely surprised by that. All right, when we come back from the break, Mitt Romney and Kirsten Cinema cozy up to rub in our faces that all these important provisions were cut out of the reconciliation bill. We'll be right back. All right, uh, back on TYT Chang and Anna with you guys, Anna. Well, the ruling class is now completely gloating about the fact that they succeeded in stripping down the budget reconciliation bill, otherwise known as Biden's Build Back Better agenda, including paid family leave, free community college, expansions to Medicare, and all sorts of things that would have improved people's lives. Here's Republican Senator Mitt Romney. Referencing the hit show Ted Lasso by giving corporate Democrat Kirsten Cinema a cookie. Now, it's important to understand the context here, right? So if you don't watch Ted Lasso, you should know that what they're referencing is Ted Lasso, the coach that was hired to basically be the coach of a soccer team in the UK. He usually gives a cookie every day to the owner of that soccer team. Now the owner of that soccer team specifically hired Ted Lasso because she knew that he would be an awful coach since he's never coached you know, European soccer before or football. And so she did it intentionally to sabotage her own team because that team happens to be the team that her ex-husband loved so much and she became in charge of after they divorced. So that's what they're referencing here. She is like laughing about the fact that she sabotaged her own political party in destroying, helping to destroy Biden's agenda. So let's break it down further. So in the Capitol, they're having a grand old time. So paid family leave is out now. So if you have a baby and your company doesn't cover it, and less than 20% of companies cover it. Um, you're gonna have to go back to work immediately, okay? Get out of the hospital, take off the robes, and get back into the uh, factories, okay? So that's gone, and they're having <laughs> biscuits for the boss. Yep. They're having a tea party in Washington. Yep. Uh, here in the districts, we're dying. The drug prices are so high, you're rationing drugs, and that's leading to people dying. But they're having tea and biscuits at the Capitol. Uh, they're having a fabulous time, yeah. and she's doing playing dress up as she did the other day. She loves to play dress up. It's literally the Hunger Games, and uh, and then the second part of it is, okay, put aside the the reference to Tad Lasso and it's a female boss. But even if it was a male boss, do you think that Mitt Romney would have done this with Bernie Sanders? Now you all know that Bernie Sanders wouldn't have done this. Why? Because they're not on the same team, but Cinema and Romney are on the same team. Cinema's technically a Democrat and Romney's technically a Republican, but they're both on team corporate donors. And they both get paid by corporate donors, and that's why they're doing this. But guys, most importantly, they're laughing at you. Yeah, that's exactly right. She knows that she sabotaged her own party, and they're making a reference to a show with a boss that tried to sabotage her own soccer team. And she knows she's with the Republicans yeah. and killed every good provision in this bill on behalf of Mitt Romney, the wealthy, and the Republicans. And you know, just to show you Mitt Romney's tweet, he's the one who said, biscuits with the boss. And you guys know how I feel about people like Kirsten Cinema. You think I think she deserves any cookies? I don't know. No cookies for you, I'm sorry. Cookies, no cookies for cinema. In fact, 
far worse. She's awful, she should be primaried. I hope people don't forget about what happened this year with her completely turning her back on her own constituents. She needs to be primaried. The election isn't for another, what, two years? Yeah. So guys, we read you all her quotes. I'm kind of sick of reading her previous quotes to you guys. She claimed she it was unconscionable not to negotiate drug prices, unconscionable not to do paid family leave, on and on. All the provisions she killed now. And as I said earlier in the show, they featured Anna on a New York Times podcast, and then I wound up listening to it. And the two reporters were like, I don't know why Cinema is doing this. It seems like it's the exact opposite of what she did was saying before. I wonder why does she think Arizona's population is more Republican than the voting? Seems to indicate a Democrat won recently. They're like, duh, duh, come on, guys. And it's amazing. So they're not evil. They're not. But the other explanation is not very good either. They're in the job of reporting and they don't know a thing about politics. In fact, in the beginning of that podcast, they claimed that, yeah, I mean, Manchin's against these provisions because he's in a purple state and he's, No, that's but mar- no, you're but doing that's, marketing for Manchin. Yeah, that's not what's happening. Well, so, don't you know, but seriously guys, you're reporters for the New York Times. Do you not know the polling out of West Virginia? In West Virginia, they want this bill desperately. And if you ask him about the specific policy proposals, it's even more popular. You know who wants lower drug prices? Of course everybody, except one group of people, drug companies. It's not complicated, it's not remotely complicated. As I said earlier in the show, you know who is against the billionaire tax? Billionaires, and they took it out because yep. they're the, the people they're trying to please are billionaires and corporations. So guys, we tell you facts and you can look them up. And by the way, the mainstream media, to their kind of credit, they also have the facts. They're not lying to you. They say it's they were arguing between three and a half trillion and one and a half trillion, and the compromise was at one point seven five trillion. So the corporate guys, Cinema, Mansion, and Biden and Pelosi totally won. They crushed the progressives. We're progressives. We wish it weren't the case, but our job is to tell you the truth. So what's the difference between us and mainstream media? They tell you the same numbers we tell you, then they frame it as oh they had to do it because the people of West Virginia. I love higher drug prices. Yeah. And Manchin is serving the people of West Virginia. And then they like an analysis for Krista Cinema. Uh, maybe she thinks Arizona turned more Republican. Well, their analysis sucks. You could be your own judge. You figure it out. Let's just do a quick exercise. Do you think 1.75 trillion is closer to 1.5 trillion or three and a half trillion? I did the math on it. You could do the math at home too. That means the corporate goons won. Do you want paid family leave? Almost every one of you wants it. Do you want lower drug prices? Do you, did you want free community college for two years? Did you want a, a tax, the Trump tax cuts to be repealed? You wanted all those things, including the Republican voters, including the tax cuts for the rich. You got none of it, but New York Times can't figure out. And and they and then uh, Romney and Cinema rub your faces in it. So every time you have a baby or anybody in your family does it, you have to go right back to work. Mansion and Cinema and Romney and those goons did that to you. Okay. Every time you can't pay for your drugs, Mansion, Cinema, Romney, and all those corporate goons they did that to you on purpose. And they did it for money. Remember when Romney was pretending like he was in favor of t- uh, child tax credits? Oh yeah, that was Remember hilarious. That? Yeah, he's voting no on everything. Of course. All right. Well, look, let's switch gears. There's other news that I want to get to, including some positive news. It turns out that maybe there could be some accountability for uh, senators engaging in insider trading. You know, something that we would go to prison for if we engaged in. All right. So here's the details to this story involving Senator Burr. According to the Securities and Exchange Commission, Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina did in fact act on material non-public information about the coronavirus pandemic and then acted on that information by selling shares of stocks that he owned and also hitting up his brother-in-law and telling him about the information that he had regarding the severity of coronavirus. Now this is in the beginning of the pandemic. This is before the American people fully understand the severity of the pandemic. He gets a closed door briefing on it because of the committees that he serves on, the intelligence committee and the health committee. And the first thing he does is he sells stocks. 
because he knows that the economy is gonna get hit by the pandemic. So after Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina dumped more than $1.6 million in stocks in February of 2020, a week before the coronavirus market crash, he called his brother-in-law. They talked for just 50 seconds. The very next minute, Burr's brother-in-law, Gerald Foth, called his broker. On the day he received the call from Burr, Foth sold between $97,000 and $280,000 worth of shares in six companies, including several that were hit particularly hard in the market swoon and economic downturn. According to the SEC, the first broker he called after hearing from Burr was out of office, so he immediately called another broker to execute the trades. This is insider trading. Number one, as I've said a billion times on the show, public servants, especially public servants in Congress who are supposed to be making decisions about legislation that impact corporations should not be invested in individual stocks. Okay, that's obviously a conflict of interest. Secondly, this is insider trading and I'm glad that the SEC continued investigating Burr, but it doesn't stop at Burr. There are other lawmakers who engage in this, so I hope they're investigating them as well. Burr sold off a significant percentage of his stock shortly before the market tanked, unloading between $628,000 and $1.72 million of his holdings on February 13th in 33 separate transactions. The precise amount of his stock sales, more than $1.6 million, is also a new detail from this week's SEC filings. And so right now, what the SEC is trying to do is get Foth, Burr's brother-in-law, to comply with the subpoena, and he's refusing to do it. In fact, ProPublica called him for comment and he just hung up on them. So he's trying to avoid any and all questions, he's not complying with the subpoena. And it's also worth noting that he's working in the federal government. So in 2017, President Donald Trump appointed Foth to a three person board, a federal agency that facilitates labor management relations within the nation's railroad and airline industries. Guess what, President Joe Biden reappointed him to the board. Because he's a loser. He's weak, he's super, super weak. Um, why the hell would you reappoint that guy? At a minimum, wouldn't you want him to cooperate with your own government before you reappointed him? And he's like, "Oh no, 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 oh, he's a Republican and he helped to rip off the American people in the worst pandemic of our lifetimes, reappoint him. Cowardice, totally. Like, but he, Biden's, what's the difference between Biden and a Republican? It's a trick question, there is no difference. So, and you, he proves it every day in things like this. Okay, now the heart of it. So Burr gets the hearing, calls up his broker, sells all his stocks, especially the ones related to the coronavirus pandemic, to the tune of $1.6 million. Then he calls up his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law first tries to get a broker. Can't find his own broker, he calls a second broker. This is all instantly, this is in the phone records, okay? Burr and his brother-in-law talked for under a minute. So obviously Burr called him and said, sell, 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 Torah, 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 okay? And so then his brother-in-law gets, finds a second broker and sells his stocks. This is not complicated. You know that before the SEC, other federal investigators dropped it. Yeah, yeah. and and. <laughs> I'm sure you guys will all be shocked to find that the Senate Ethics Committee looked into it and they found no wrongdoing. They're like, what, uh, us ripping off the American taxpayers for our own enrichment? They're like, that's not the bug, that's the feature. They probably threw Burr a party. <laughs> so uh, look, is the SEC going to hold them accountable? This is the most clear cut case of insider trading that I've probably ever seen in my life. We'd all you, go to you prison. Could, yeah, oh, it's that Martha Stewart went to prison for far, yeah. far, far less, yep. okay? And she's wealthy. If you did it, oh, you would be eviscerated. It would ruin your life. You might go to jail for 10, 15 years, right? Mm -hmm. Burr brazenly comes out of the hearing, makes the call, dumps the stocks, calls his brother-in-law, he dumps the stocks. It's all on the record, the phone calls are on the record, the financial transactions are on the record. And everybody in power in Washington is like, I can't see it, where is it? Where is it, I don't see it. No, no, free to go. So let's see what the SEC does, but it would be shocking if any of the elites were ever held accountable for any of their crimes. That does it for our first hour, but when we come back for hour two, we'll talk about Ted Cruz defending Nazi salutes at school boards. And also Tucker Carlson is leaning way in to disinformation regarding January 6th. 
And it's kind of terrifying because what he's putting out there is just gonna lead to more violence. We'll be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Young Turks. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, Cenk Uger, and I'll see you soon.